Okay, so I want to show you the book. Uh, the book is called The Holistic Haggadah, and it's written by, uh, the author is Michael Kagan, great teacher, I really love him. He, uh, he brought together a lot of great spiritual teachings on the Passover Seder, and what I'd like to jump into uh, together today is the teaching on uh, the four uh, the four sons in the Haggadah, or the four children. And that is really critical to understand because what it's touching on is how um, we all as people, we're all different, we learn differently, and we, we understand differently. So... Uh, when we're going to sit down at the Seder to talk about liberation or anything, even whatever I'm talking about now, um, you know, any person uh, would take something different based on who you are. When I hear a teaching uh, by a teacher, uh, I hear what I need to hear. And uh, it's always the case that... Um, Somebody else in the class will hear what they need to hear, and that's because of our different makeups. So let's begin. The four children. Blessed is the present one, blessed is he, blessed is the one who gave the Torah to her people Israel, blessed is he. About four children did the Torah speak. One wise, one alienated, one naive, and one who does not know how to ask. So inter interesting. This is a um, an ancient uh, personality uh, scheme or personality theory uh, that divides uh, people into at least four different types. The wise one. What does he say? And this is a quote from um, from the midrash. What does he say? What are these testimonies, rules, and legalities which the which Adonai our God has commanded you to do? The alienated one. What does she say? What does all this service mean to you? Again, now here's the cynicism. I kind of jumped the gun before. To you rather than herself. And thus she excludes herself from the community and rejects a fundamental tenet. Then you need to soften the sharpness of her bite and say to her, because of what Adonai did for me in bringing me out of, uh, out of Mitzrayim, me rather than her, as if to say that had she been there with an attitude like that, she would not have been redeemed. <laughs> so it's calling on her attitude, right? Come on. How many times have we said, said to our children, how many times have I said to my son, quit the attitude, <laughs> right? So when the uh, alienated child is being cynical with you, you don't get caught up in that. You don't respond to, uh, you know, to the substance. But you say, well, you know, let's talk about the attitude here and let's see if we can actually connect instead of being in uh, butting heads on this. Okay, and then there's the next child or the, or the next personality type. And let me read what the Haggadah says. The naive one, what does she say? What is this? That's it. What is this? And you will say to her, with a, with a determined hand, Adonai brought us out of Egypt from the crucible of slavery. That, that's simple. So the question is simple. The heart is simple. The, the, desire, the desire to know is, is, is pure. And you give a pure answer. You give, you give a, an answer that's uh, at that level. And the one that doesn't know how to ask, that is the fourth child of the fourth, per, fourth personality type. Prompt her like this. And on that day, you will tell your child, saying, we are doing this because of what God did for me 
when I came out of Mitzrayim. Okay. Well, so we just reviewed the literal... Um, hi, Elliot. <laughs> I see that you're on. All right, here, let me click a wave to you. Thanks for coming on. All right, so here is uh, the commentary by um, by Michael um, Michael Kagan, and um, what's nice about his writing is that he um, he really addresses it from um, different perspectives, and the first perspective he calls being. Let's jump right in. The wise one. What kind of question is she asking? Is this really the question one would expect from a wise child? And what kind of answer is being given? Why does it say, a Pesach Afikoman, the Paschal Lamb dessert? In other words, why is the answer to the wise one about that specific law? And let me explain the law. The law is that um, the last thing that we eat at the end of the Seder is the what we call the afikoman, which is the afikoman is the Greek word for dessert, but the dessert in uh, for this meal is a piece of the matzah that we broke at the beginning of the meal. So we sandwich the entire meal between two pieces of matzah. We break it in two halves. At the beginning of the meal, we say a blessing on one half, and we eat the afikoman as a very last piece of food we, we taste at the end of the meal because we want to leave the meal with that essential flavor of matzah, which symbolizes liberation, symbolizes um, the bread of poverty, symbolizes the memory of, uh, you know, of, of the struggle, it symbolizes the thinness, right? The matzah is thin. The uh, thin means uh, essential. So it symbolizes the, um, the essential message of, of actually being human, right? So matzah is bread without puff, and that's the same as a soul without ego, right? So it's thin. It's like the core of things. And we want to leave with that flavor. And that is one of those laws, one of those instructions about how is the, uh, uh, the Passover Seder how is the meal different than all other meals, or all of the nights? Is that instead of having ice cream or, you know, or kosher Passover cake or candy or fruit or whatever it is, uh, you know, your dessert is, you can have the dessert, but then you take a bite of the afikoman and that's the last thing you eat. So the question is, why is that law the answer to the wise child's question. And what does a become an actually mean? Well, I jumped the, the gun. I'm going to go back to Michael Kagan here. One way of understanding this is as follows. The child is actually asking, what are we to do with all these divine instructions concerning the particulars of the observance of the Paschal sacrifice if we no longer have a temple or a sacrifice? Uh-huh. Smart kid. Right? So the kid says, you know, the, the original observance of Passover was actually a sacrifice, but there is no more temple. Sacrifices, we, don't, we haven't done sacrifices for 2,000 years. Come on. Who needs this? You know, enough with this Paschal lamb on the Seder plate. And, uh, you know, it's, it's like a passé. It's 2,000 years old. Um, all right, so... What I make of this, and what excites me here, is that what does continuity mean? It's not continuity of, of the Jewish people, but it's continuity of essence. How do I, in my life, and, you know, in relation to Passover, how do I make sure that the spiritual essence that is probably what I'm here in life for. How does that continue? How do I not get caught up in the trappings of, 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 a, of, a celeb of, of an observance? So the answer to that child is, no, we don't want to be 
stuck in the past and observing something from, you know, from before. But we want to take that principle of the taste of the Paschal Lamb that held the memory of the event of liberation, that awesome transformative kind of breaking out of slavery, both politically and spiritually, into the freedom of the desert. And the last thing we ate before we actually packed up our, you know, our belongings and set out on the way was the lamb. And then every year on Passover, until the temple was destroyed 2,000 years ago, that was the last thing we ate on the night of celebrating Passover. Now the afikoma, that piece of matzah, is what we eat, the last flavor of the Passover. But that does not symbolize the past. That symbolizes what we're going towards. Right? The afikoman is the, the taste of the state that we're aspiring for. That inner freedom, that, that cleanse, that bare bone essence, that goodness that's within me, that's promised land that we're heading towards. That is the flavor of the Afikoman. Nice. <laughs> so if I'm observing, and if the flavor is about something I'm aspiring to, something that I'm heading towards, you know, the Buddhist tradition it would be, I'm heading towards enlightenment. Right? In, uh, in the Christian tradition it would be, I'm heading towards the second coming of, uh, of Christ, of that ideal, ideal um, model, paradigm of connection to, to the divine, to the whole. And in our tradition, we are, uh, we are moving towards returning to the promised land. We're now in exile. Right? But all of Israel will come back to the promised land. And that's a metaphor for coming back home. Coming back home. Wow. <laughs> so I'll continue here with, uh, with Michael. The alienated one, she's not overly concerned with the future of the community, thereby becoming even more alienated from it. So that's a second child, a different attitude. Rebellious attitude. Actually, how many of us have been the alienated child? I want to suggest that perhaps we are a generation of alienated children. Where we have a tradition and we look at it and it's like, oh my God. <laughs> you know, so many details, so much stuff, so much literature, so many words, it's so verbal. It's so complicated. And then there's the baggage. I mean, you know, the cost for holding this tradition is the Holocaust, it's the pogroms, it's the uh, it's anti-Semitism, it's, uh, um, you know, Etz Chaim in Pittsburgh, um, it's, it's Israel in continuous conflict. What a price, what a price to, to, to hold this tradition. So how many times have we had the impulse to say, what is this all about? Is this really for me? Or for those who practice or are involved, really, guys, what's, what, what are you about? Are you for real? All right, so um, she is angry. She actually doesn't even ask a question, but rather makes her a rhetorical statement. She demands to know what the point of all this service is if God has allowed the destruction of the temple to happen again. Boy, you know, I, I just want to honor the alienated child because as I'm, as I'm reading this and as, as we're discussing it, um, the alienated child is, is, uh, is really the, uh, the place where, uh, where our pain lies as Jews. This is, this is the baggage. Here we are. The alienated child is, is, is the child we need to honor because we, she's heavy. We're carrying her in our, in our psyche. 
With compassion and understanding must come the answer. I want to say that also. I want to put myself in the shoes of the alienated child now and say, I need to be treated kindly. I need tradition to say to me, you're okay. I'm sorry. All this pain is too much. I need to hear compassion. I need to hear the voice of compassion in our tradition. So I just want to, I just want to voice that. Uh, so I'm, I'm identifying here with the alienated child and embracing her. So Michael Kagan continues, um, so help her soften. Explain that a rejection of the divine is a rejection of self. That giving up leads to self-condemnation in the crucible of enslavement. That the divine love penetrates through the thickest darkness. Okay, so let's take a moment to breathe on this and integrate uh, uh, Michael's uh, commentary here on both the wise child and the alienated child and, um, and the wisdom of, of responding differently to both. And these are both places in me too. There's a place in me that just really uh, thinks smartly about uh, what tradition is is uh, offering, and then the one that's uh, cynical and hurt and uh, and wants to be a little provocative and and uh, and feisty. And now we'll go to um, a little deeper. Here's Michael again. So the four children, the wise one, the alienated one, the naive one, and the one who does not know how to ask. Taken in the opposite order, they aptly describe the natural development of the human individual. Beautiful. The stage at which we are too young to even formulate the questions. The stage at which we can only ask the innocent questions the rebellious stage, when it's all your stuff, not mine, to the understanding stage of intellectual maturity. Beautiful, isn't it? But that's not the end of the journey. After the natural development program comes the spiritual development opportunities. The stuck-in-the-head self needs to go through a rebellion against rationalism as a total means of understanding. Maybe even a, sus a suspension of dogmat dogmatic religious practice in order to discover what's behind it. And you know, maybe this is actually another, um, another sign, another mark of our generation. How many of us have uh, actually rebelled, had to, had to uh, uh, step away, and this is my story as well, in order to, from a distance, re-examine tradition and say, wow, there's actually something there, and there's something I want to reconnect with. That would be the fifth child, by the child that asks what? That, that, that question is not in the Haggadah. Maybe it's on the Haggadah because we left the Haggadah behind and now we're coming back to it. And this this year, this Seder, let us ask the fifth child's question, which is unwritten. It's a question that's in our heart. And it's the question that we can only ask from the place of having practiced Zen Buddhism and having practiced Tibetan Buddhism and having practiced shamanism and having pra having practiced explored Sufism and having explored um, um, you know perennial um, uh, spirituality and having explored uh, mindfulness and all those things and now I come back and boy I have new tools with which to um, sit sit at that table and ask the question, what is this all about? What is liberation all about? What's matzah all about? What's this night all about? So the innocent stage is when the true questions are rediscovered. Simple questions that go straight to the heart of the matter. Finally, the point is reached when one, when no more questions are necessary, when comfort and wisdom are found in silence, 
when the answer is simply because. How would you say because in Hebrew? And this is, I, I'm actually uh, um, leading us here to a Seder term, a term, well-known Seder, Seder term, and it's, it's also a song. So because is Dayenu. It's enough. As it is, it's enough. Not enough stop, but enough is plenty. Right? Dayenu. It is as it is because it is. Just because. Oh boy, we should, we should all be blessed to uh, to ascend. You know, I'm thinking of the Baal Shem Tov's ascent. We should all be blessed to ascend to uh, that fifth, fifth child's state of it all is okay just because. So we'll wrap this up in uh, one last paragraph. Um, and here we go. So the four parents... The types of questions that our children ask are direct reflections of the kind of relationships that we have built with them. Uh, it's, just, it's just profound. Just profound. I'm going to read this again because this really, really touches me deeply. The type of questions that our children ask are direct reflections of the kind of relationships that we have built with them. A parent who relates to a child on a singularly intellectual level will spawn a child who can only relate to the world, to the emotional world, to the experiential world, through the mind. Some would call this wise, quote-unquote. Others might call this limited. Then there are parents who themselves feel alienated from the events of their ancestors and are not attempting to form a meaningful relationship with the present one, blessed be he or she. What do they expect when their child turns around with anger and disdain? Boy, folks, I work with so many uh, bar and bat mitzvah age kids, and they mirror you know, in addition to their natural beauty and curiosity and and aliveness and desire to learn, um, I have not met the child who is not just completely able to be excited and engaged and 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 full and and absorb uh, new information and inspiration in 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 a, in a full way that so many of us adults have lost and. I want to add to that, every child that I meet in some ways reflects the confusion, often the confusion and the alienation and the ambivalence and the, um, and the unresolved questioning of, of their parents at home. And often I get these questions from children that I know are not their questions, but questions they ha had heard often their parents um, express through snide or cynical comments. So I'm going to read this again. Then there are parents who themselves feel alienated from the events of their ancestors and are not attempting to form a meaningful relationship with the present one blessed be she. What do they expect when their child turns around with anger and disdain? And how many of us don't take our children seriously? Not really listening to their questions constantly dismissing them as silly. Guilty as charged. Oh, there's so many conversations that I've had with, uh, with my boy, Phelan, that I wish I could have uh, turned the wheel on and done it, done, done it differently. Maybe your child is not so much so naive as pure. Maybe you need to start listening more. Finally, there is the parent who is never around long enough for the child to even ask, the absentee parent. How about slowing down a bit and spending some time tending the garden, the garden of the heart? 
by listening to your ch to your children, maybe you can learn something about yourself. By listening to your inner child, maybe you can learn to heal yourself. Open the child's mouth. Help her give expression to the suppressed voices. Oh, this is <laughs> deep and challenge challenging wisdom here from uh, Michael Kagan. So we'll end with uh, a story uh, of the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov sent his disciple Rabbi, Rabbi Yaakov Yosef of Polonoi to test the learning of Reb Yechiel, a prospective husband for his daughter Adele. When Rabbi Yaakov Yosef returned from his mission, he told the Baal Shem Tov, To everything I asked him, Reb Yechiel answered, I don't know. I wonder about him. Gewalt, exclaimed the Baal Shem Tov. I'd love to have him as a son-in-law. <laughs> so, with that, I want to wish us all a, a, an amazing Seder. This was a little touch on the four children. Uh, to review it quickly, uh, there are four personality types. There are four stages of development in, uh, in our own uh, journey of growth from childhood to adulthood. We touched on the fifth children, the question that has not been asked yet, that you and I, God willing, will ask at, uh, on Friday night or any night that you're doing a Seder this, uh, uh, this week and uh, this coming week. And that as parents, the four children mirror the four parents or the five parents. And how much, how much better can we do, can I do? Let me speak for myself. Um, you know, this is really sensitizing me to, um, uh, to my role as a parent in my relationship and how the Seder is a relational opportunity. It's a time to connect. It's a, it's a time to tell the story from heart to heart. Words from the heart reach the heart. And let us set, set that intention for this Passover Seder. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming on and watching. Um, I see Heather... Um, Adam, thank you for being there, and um, uh, we'll, we'll come back tomorrow. Uh, this is going to be a daily broadcast, uh, touching on different parts of the Seder. Um, I'm not sure what we'll talk about tomorrow, but maybe the Manishtana. And uh, with that, I wish you an amazing day.